Hey everyone, welcome to the Beyond the Excellence podcast brought to you by the Coaches Site, the number one online resource for hockey coaches. This podcast is hosted by myself, Dr. Cassie Preston, a mental performance coach and founder of CEP Mindset, and Christy Piero, who has spent the past 30 plus years in the game of hockey from the NHL on down, including where he coached me back in our, our my junior days. And now we get to work together in the mental performance and leadership space. There's we're going to get pretty quick into the episode today because it's a big one. It's pretty heated, but a couple fun, interesting news things to share off the bat. One, if you have not watched Ted Lasso, go and watch Ted Lasso. Season three is coming out March 15th. And our next season of the Beyond the Excellence podcast will be recording a episode, a podcast episode after every episode. So it's going to be a lot of fun. We're doing that with Aaron Wilbur from the coaches site. It's going to be great. There's all kinds of leadership. Uh, human skills mindset within that show so it's a lot of um, a lot of fun to watch it'll be a lot of fun to do that uh, those podcasts second thing I also wanted to share too uh, if you're you can check out um, my the blogs the YouTubes the podcast we're also doing on CP mindset so go visit that at cpmindset.com uh, especially for our, any teams going into playoffs right now we just dropped a great video, great blog about performing under pressure and some key steps and on the mental side of the concepts to deal with that pressure, as well as the strategies and how to roll it out and make sure yourself, your teams are playing at their best. So let's get into the, the episode here, Chris. Um, we won't spoil too much, but this was a big one for us. We were been talking about doing this for a while and, and we jumped in, we got after it. There's uh, there was a lot to be said about is hockey broken? What's What's your take on a quick summary here before we let the listeners dive in? Yeah, it was quite the episode indeed. And certainly um, just the, the the title is Hockey Broken. Kind of, a, you know, it's a, it's a big topic to, to delve into and discuss. And I thought uh, it was fun, um, you know, recording it with you and just kind of talk about it. My, my sense is, Cass, we just talked about the tip of the iceberg. There's so much more we could have gotten into and maybe we'll do a follow-up based on if people are interested in listening to uh, this one and want more, you know, kind of discussion surrounding that we'll see. And maybe uh, it may warrant a, a second, a second podcast to follow up because I think certainly uh, we only got the tip of the iceberg. Yeah, for sure. And uh, we won't spoil too much here, but you know, the gist is I, you know, we're pretty much, yeah, hockey's broken and we're going to dive into, we dissect, you know, our why, what are all the things that are the, the signs, why there's so many destructive behaviors and practices that are normalized and repeated at all levels. And then, and this is not just a hockey thing. And, and we touch on that. And then we talk a lot about obviously leadership, some bottom up uh, approaches, as well as the top down approaches that are needed. And then, you know, what does it mean to be fixed and, and start getting into some discussions around what are we measuring? What are we tracking? How can we make progress? And, uh, and so there's some reflection points there. So, I think we're going to leave it at that unless you got any final thoughts and, and let the listeners dive in here. Let them go. Enjoy the, enjoy the episode. Awesome. So thanks everyone. Enjoy the episode. Make sure to comment, like, subscribe, all that fun stuff and enjoy as we continue to go beyond the X and O's. The Coaches Site is hockey's leading online coaching resource and was created to provide hockey's top coaches, leaders, and performance experts with a platform to share their experience and insights with coaches and organizations of all levels with the goal of enhancing the development opportunity for their players. A membership includes access to 500 hours of educational videos, a library of over 700 drills, articles breaking down the latest tactics and systems, and the opportunity to join a coaching community of over 15,000 coaches from around the world. Regardless of the level you coach, the Coaches Site is going to provide you the ultimate coaching toolkit. Listeners of the Beyond the X's and O's podcast can save 25% off an annual membership by using the code BEOUTSTANDING when you register. Again, get registered today by using the code BEOUTSTANDING at thecoachesite.com. CP Mindset provides mental performance coaching to lead athletes, teams, coaches, and business executives so they can achieve consistently performance. Our one-on-one -on -one coaching programs help lead athletes break through their mental blocks and take their game to the next level. In addition, we offer team programs that help athletes improve their mental game and leadership skills. An important part of these programs is we work with you, the coach, to go beyond the X's and O's. We help you develop the human skills of leadership and become your listening partner. Just like athletes need coaches, so do coaches. 
And at CEP Mindset, we don't just work in sport. We also work with high-performing business executives and professionals, especially those who relate to being an elite athlete and want a similar approach to optimizing their performance and work and life. Find out more at cpmindset.com. All right, Cass, is hockey broken? Oh, I've, uh, I'm, I'm geared up here, Chris. Um, so something I wanted to dive into. And, you know, the quick answer is, in my opinion, a hard yes. Like, uh, I'm pretty fed up, pretty frustrated. You know, we've been talking about this on the podcast in different ways. Back in our declaration of war against old school coaching, even in this season that, that we're currently in back in September, we went on a bit of a rant about accountability in Hockey Canada. And, and you know, I see it a lot. You see it as well. You know, the players we work with, the athletes, the, the culture itself, there's just a lot of things that grind my gears. And whether it's at the junior level or minor hockey and even the pros, and, and the pros is one thing because guys are making a lot of money and they're not getting treated well. And there, there's things that they, the pros are the pros. But when we're talking about junior hockey and we've got five guys getting healthy scratched at 16, 17, 18, we got guys not getting played. They're, they're getting neglected, which is a form of emotional abuse and not being treated like people. I think it's it's really broken. And there's some places, and, and we've talked about this before, where there's coaches and, and organizations doing good things, but it's just too much. I, just, I can just see it, and I just see the structure in it. Mike Snee really got me going back in that episode, which was a great episode, around the model itself. Because it's not about that the people are broken. I think generally most people at all the different levels, they're trying to do the best that they can, whether it's coaches, leaders, players, teammates. But it's the structure that really just pushes this sink or swim model that's really about performance. And and it's tough on players at the junior level. And there's tons of guys that are just getting treated like a number instead of in their prime, their 16, 17, 18 year olds, their prime development time. And they're just not playing and not being played well, not being treated well, not being communicated to fairly. And then this just gets trickled down, which even is even worse now at the minor hockey, the minor midget years, the, the U 16, 15, 13. And they're continuing to follow this professionalization model that is so much about results and, and there's just so many problems at different levels. And I know we're going to get into it in a lot of different ways. But yeah, my opinion is it's broken. We're going to talk about it a bit more in different ways. Talk about you know our suggestions and thoughts just around where to go next, what to do from a leadership standpoint. But yeah, I've, uh, I've been raring to go on this episode for a while because I, like, I get frustrated you know, multiple times a week just hearing the stuff that I hear from players at different levels. Uh, from the top levels to to the junior and uh, and even some of the minor hockey stuff. So, what what's your take, Chris? I know I, I want to go off on a few more tangents, but I'll let you uh, jump in here as well. No, it's great. I, I mean, obviously you're you're passionate, you love it, and and as do I. I mean, certainly you know hockey is something that's uh, that's galvanized that galvanizes a lot of people and it gets everybody excited. And 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 certainly when things um, kind of I mean, like you, I think you, you, you kind of hit the nail on the head in terms of, you know, we have kind of a unique view uh, of, of the game through the, the clients that we work with. And it, it, it you know, it's great because, you know, on one level it's, it's allowed the business to grow and your, your business is growing because of you know, what's, what's, what's wrong with hockey. But on another level, it's also a sad part or sad sort of indictment on the sport that, you know, that that's happening. And, you know, like you say, the stories, the, 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 you know, the, 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 the issues that I guess that we deal with on a, on a daily basis with the clients we work with, um, it's, it's, it's challenging. It's challenging. And, and it's being able to equip, you know, these young hockey players, these young athletes with uh, the tools to be able to deal with, with things, but it's hard because they don't know how to deal with them. They don't, because I think that professionalization of the sport is coming down right into minor hockey and and it, there's something inherently wrong with that. There's something inherently wrong. And you referenced Mike Snee, and I, you know, for the people who didn't hear that that episode with you know with uh, Mike Snee, the the executive director of College Hockey Inc., I certainly encourage you to go back, listen to it, 
because he really delves into the Minnesota hockey model. And what's interesting there, and he kind of, I think in there, there's a stat that he uses that the uh, the state of Minnesota pr- is producing more NHL players. So the, the idea of the results component is done in terms of if it's about making the NHL, their model of community-based hockey, you know, everybody kind of helping each other out. The Scandinavian model, the Finnish, Swedish kind of model, is what Minnesota patterns is themselves at, at and uh, great great episode. But anyways, I'm I'm digressing because I think there's certainly a uh, a, a tangent that I can go on with that, um, and it's it's kind of led us to, to obviously having this great uh, this great topic tonight. Yeah, and I'll make one point. It's not that it's just about hockey because there is other sports where the structure and the system isn't working well and there's problems in more than just hockey. This is not just a hockey problem. We're obviously focusing more on hockey. We work with a lot of hockey players. We work with other athletes too. And, you know, being from Canada, we're in Canada. It's one of our biggest sports with a lot of focus and attention uh, gets put on. And what's interesting, and let's stick on the junior before we jump down to the the U sport, is I, I just think the way junior hockey – the, the Canadian Hockey League, the, the, the structure of it, there's just a lot of problems. When it is supposed to be a development league, and yet it's very much run like a business and run like the professionals, where it's, you know, people, are, there's a lot of money. Coaches make a lot of money. The organizations can make a lot of money. And then 16 and 17 and 18-year-olds who have worked their whole life, they're on a, a pretty steep career path to potentially become professionals are then not getting played. There's teams with five guys getting healthy scratched every night. And even if they're in the lineup, they're getting five minutes, two minutes, eight minutes. There's no accountability for the teams to run an actual development system. It's about winning. And and it couldn't be more clear than that. And I think one of the analogies, and I've uh, it's worked actually quite well with a lot of my players, is the scuba diving analogy. Because I use it where instead of thinking about hockey, you think about surfing. If you're out there surfing, well, you want to be the one surfing. But sometimes and often in junior hockey and even in sometimes in minor hockey, but definitely in junior, you get scratched or you don't get played for 10 minutes or whatever. It's a long period of time. You're like sitting out on the waves watching everyone surf, which is you want to be doing. And then you're taking waves in the face. It is demoralizing. It is really frustrating. It's really tough mentally, emotionally, and, and you're not getting the opportunity to develop. And so I use this analogy, well, maybe you need to scuba dive. Because checking out, having a bad attitude, you know, is not going to work. And it's mentally um, draining to just sit there and watch everyone else play the game you love. And then you're not getting the feedback and support. So they put their scuba gear on mentally and they just sit tight. They can a better state where things are calmer and they can and get perspective. And so I don't want that to be used now like, oh, well, let's let's just get my players to do that. And I can scratch guys. And not play. No, that's not the point. I, sh- I shouldn't have to be teaching a 16 year old that's, you know, first, second round draft picks in major junior hockey, how to deal with that kind of adversity at that age. They should be supported by their coaches, be getting development opportunities. Instead of got guys getting scratched for multiple games at a time in tough situations. And, and there's just no way to work and get up now. You know, I'm sure their career is going to be fine. I'm not really worried about that and them and, and these guys have the tools, but I know other guys that don't and they don't have the tools and the support and they're spiraling and it is, you know, not good for their development, for their mindset, for their mental health. And, and the interesting thing around all of it too, is like they're 16, 17, 18 year old boys, the maturity level, they're still not that mature. We want to support their development maturity, which goes back to Mike Sneeze. A lot of time, they're not even at home anymore. They're living on their own or they're, or, or they're living with billets, but they're not really their parents and, and having that support to help them continue to mature. And are the coaches really helping support them and maturing and supporting them? Or are we enabling and normalizing all these other issue, issues like what Brock McGillis talked about, Ray Carnegie talked about? Like there's so many different issues that then get perpetuated and the maturity and the ages. So I've got a lot of issues there within the sport and just the whole structure against not the people per se be, but I think hockey Canada, you know, the governing bodies, provincial bodies, leagues can really continue to take a hard look at the way the leagues are set up and how that then trickles down into the behaviors of the coaches, the teams, how things are run, how people are treated and the experience of 
our youth at 17 and 18, which are critical development years. And um, like I said, I'm, a, I'm pretty, uh, it's frustrating from my side and it's, you know, and, and we'll get into the fix thing in a bit, but it, like there is no clear answer, but th- there is some things we can do. Do you want to hit anything on this? Otherwise I'll start going on a rant about minor hockey, which is a whole other thing, but the, <laughs> so the, the one thing I do want to touch I, on the, on the junior stuff. Yeah, no, I do want to touch upon and and, you, and is the concept of the normalizing of the behavior and 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 unfortunately, you I mean you look at you know and junior hockey, college hockey, it's kind of like any any kind of higher level hockey, you know, sometimes certain behaviors become normalized to to kind of mask, you know, the idea of hey, we need to have success and success is defined by that wins and the wins and losses because we've got this business, we got to put asses in the seats and yada 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 as opposed to creating a culture and, you know, the culture word gets used a lot, but creating an environment, you know, that, that is conducive to pick a, pick, pick a value, excellence, uh, you know, success. What does that, what does that mean? And defining it beyond, you know, the, the W or the L that you get after a game, defining it based on other, other, you know, parameters. And I think that's the part that I think gets missed. Some organizations, some presidents, some owners do this. They certainly do this, but the vast majority do not because they get to a certain point and then they just don't have the stones or the stomach to see it right through. So then that's when the coach gets fired. That's when the trade happens. Hey, we got to trade this or, you know, certain things happen. And I think that's where you talk about the normalization of, of certain behaviors. My concern, ultimately, there's the old saying, power corrupts and absolute power corrupts absolutely. It's a famous saying. I always say power doesn't corrupt. It reveals what you're, what you're all about as a person. So when certain people, you know, ascend to a certain power and you know, arise to certain levels of of, uh, of leadership within an organization, it reveals what the, what's true to them in their character. And I think that's where some people get get corrupted along the way, and it's unfortunate because that's where the normalization is allowed. And and I think that's where the governing bodies that you speak of can be a little bit more, you know, show some leadership and show some, you know, for lack of a better term, stones, cojones. You know, to be able to sit there and say, this is what we stand for. This is what we're all about. We need to be better. We need to be better because we need to produce better human beings. So that's my little bit of a, of a rant based on my experiences, you know, as a, as a coach, as a GM, you know, as a father, as a teacher, you know, a high school administrator, like all this stuff comes in because, you know, I see it in various forms. Um, and it's certainly we need to be better. The game of hockey needs this to be better. Yeah. And I think, you know, it's, it's a great point. I think the measure thing, and we're going to loop back around that and, you know, at near the end when we're talking about how to move forward and the fix. And I think what we measure matters, what we prioritize matters. And that's at the junior levels and, and, and higher. And even like in, in the, the, the top teams that I work with and athletics, we get them to measure things more within their control because not everybody can win every day. Not everyone can put up points. So measure something more within your control that's going to help lead to that. And that gives you a sense of direction and consistent progress and helps you stay focused on the things you can control. And when players and teams do that, they get more success as well. But it's, if everybody's doing it, like not everybody, not everybody can win the league. Not everybody can win all the time. Not everyone can have an 800 winning percentage, but can we be learning? Can we be growing? Can we create an environment? Can we keep innovating? And like you said, I think you know the power corrupts. And what's interesting too, you know, and maybe you want to comment on this one, I know, I think it's in uh, some of the leagues in Ontario in junior A and tier one or tier two, they can't sit um, underage players. You're not allowed to scratch them. And, but yet you can in, in major junior. And, and I think there'd be interesting. And it's like, how many, how many players, like, again, that probably doesn't fix a lot of the other problems, but it's interesting, you know, what innovative and new ways can we continue to grow and fix problems and measure and, and create more of a development model Instead of the like, you know, five guys getting scratched and, you know, kids that are 16, 17 year olds getting scratched. But I think it's, it's really interesting. And when, and I brought up earlier and I want to circle back to it, the emotional abuse concept, by no means am I an expert in emotional abuse, but I definitely, uh, part of my training and my master's and, and PhD, particularly my master's 
we talk a lot about um, a safe sport environment, sports safety environment where, you know, what is emotional abuse? And like I alluded to, neglect's often one of the worst ones. And that's one of the more common ones we see. A player getting scratched, not talked to. Players not getting playing time. There's no feedback. And and coaches overly focusing on the top guys and just neglecting the, the bottom tier guys, let alone the emotional abuse around, you know, the verbal abuse around, you know, degrading, belittling players and how they speak to or, or um, and the, the hierarchy within a team. You know, those are all these issues that aren't now just a junior hockey problem, but even in minor hockey, that's there. Maybe the playing time isn't as bad, but there's tons of examples in U18, U16, 15, where there's lots of players not getting significant ice time. And those coaches are also like they're getting paid, in particular in, in Ontario, in the GTHL area. And so, and there's how are they, you know, measured results, performance. And so what's going to help them perform well, like playing the better players and not playing the worst ones. And so the, actually, actually I think it was, uh, I, I saw someone, I think it was Topher Scott or somebody, they posted something the other week about a, a parent emailing being like, can you just play the better players? That's how you win games. It's like, oh my gosh, is this a joke? But um, it's, it, it, it gets trickled down and that's what, you know, is, is a problematic and you've got kids falling out of love with the game, not getting to develop, not learning to uh, be treated fairly and, um, and support it. And again, I'm not saying that everything, everything needs to be just sunshine and rainbows. And everyone gets equal playing time. That's not what this is about, but it's how you treat the players that aren't getting as much playing time and putting some structures in place within the leagues, the organizations, hockey Canada, the governing bodies, to create a better system where more people are on the same page, where it's the standard and normalized. This is how we operate. This is the healthy and the best practices to create a good environment, to create a good development process, to create a healthy and fun experience for the players that are developing and climbing the ranks. So, you know, I'll, I'll get into a few other things, but do you want to maybe, you know, flip the gears? There's lots in, in the minor hockey challenges and problems here that that also further allude to you know, the structure of, of, you know, hockey and, and the, what's broken about it here, Chris. Well, you know how I've been on a, my, my kind of a pursuit has always been about having coaches become leaders. And, and my biggest thing is what are these hockey governing bodies doing to equip coaches to become better leaders, leaders of young men, leaders of young girl, like women, young women in the, in the sport, in the hockey spaces that they're coaching. And to that point, that's the very essence of this podcast is to go beyond the X's and O's. I, as a coach, I can jump in on YouTube and find drills coming out of my wazoo that, you know, so-and-so does this on the power play, the Detroit Red Wings do this in the PK, and, and coaches are trying to teach the one three one pp to, to six-year-olds. But yet those coaches don't know how to deal with a six-year-old who, who didn't get enough ice time. They don't know how to deal with that teenager you know, and being able to be equipped properly to be able to deal with the teenager who may have failed a math test earlier in the day, come into your practice, you bark at him because you don't know that stuff because you're not in tune or creating a relationship with that guy. And all of a sudden you're barking at him because he missed a pass on the breakout, you know, in, in, in the, some drill that you picked up from, you know, whatever the, the, you know, the Toronto Maple Leafs. And so the point is I, I, where my rant is, I get, I have a rant with the coach education. I have a rant with the the lack of you know uh, leadership from top down to be able to say this is what you need. Now I'm again I'm I'm far from sunshine and rainbows and you know that, that doesn't need to be that because I truly believe in my heart of hearts, especially teenagers, teenage boys need crave and want structure. But what I believe as an educator, what structure is, is very different to what a lot of coaches believe what structure is out there. They believe structures, yelling, screaming, demeaning, sitting, do as I say, all the stuff we talked about last season in terms of the old school mentality. That's what they believe. And I just think that's what's lacking here, Cass. That's what I believe is wrong with hockey. And we talk about trying to turn, you know, develop players, develop better humans. Well, let's equip our coaches with more than just drills more than just systems you know i'll talk about systems coming out of my wazoo i can i can riff with you know anybody about systems but the essence of coaching is is being a leader and being able to take little johnny 
who's 17 years old and developing him from September to April, not trading little Johnny, who's 17, from Toronto to Alberta. And then he gets to Alberta and he gets traded to Ottawa League. And then from the Ottawa League, he gets traded to, you know, you know, Powassan in the Northern Ontario League. That, that's just, that's asinine. That's asinine. And I think that's where we need to equip our coaches better. Sorry, I'm going on a tangent because that's the essence of this podcast is to go beyond the X's and O's. And that's where coaching to me is the difference. That's where organizations, GMs, presidents, owners at the, at the CHL level and the junior A level can make a difference is being able to show some leadership skills, show some leadership stones to be able to say, this is who we are. This is what we're all about. We're not going to trade those kids. You know, you pick, you say to your coach, you pick that kid, you develop them, challenge that coach. The easy way is to trade them across the country or whatever it is. The easy way is to to sit them in the stands and not develop them. So that's my rant. I just think we need to be, create better leaders amongst our, our, our coaches, our managers, our presidents, our owners, make them be better leaders. That's where the accountability should lie. And, uh, yeah. No, yeah, I uh, I don't know if I've gone on this rant or and I'm going to double down on your rant in, in a way because, and, and maybe I haven't gone on this in, in our podcast, but one of the studies in my dissertation was about coach education and particularly the HP1, which it's probably evolved since I, I studied it, but the the premise and, and all the general coach education and the way, again, organizations or leagues or governing bodies, there's very little of, you know, I don't think generally, and, and the study that I've done, it's it's not a well done part of addressing the exosomes. There's great research. Like we're not just making stuff up. Autonomy sport of coaching is a real thing. Athlete-centered coaching, transformational coaching, there is research behind what are the behaviors? How do you operate? How do we look at the human skills, assess it and develop behaviors and habits? It's not just some made up concept. This stuff is real. It's tangible in ways. It's a lot harder to teach and work on for sure than just working on a breakout, but it's the most important part at all levels in a lot of ways. Obviously you need some fundamental technical, tactical skills, but this is what is impacting. This is what is needed most right now. So you're right to go on a rant because it's what's missing. We need to continue to instill a standard and a way to look at this is what we want our leaders, people in leadership positions, how we want to operate and get common language, get common direction. And so that it becomes, we start normalizing. This is how we operate. We treat people, we work. And instead of getting like some people doing it and then others doing that. And it's like, oh yeah, this, I'm just going to keep focusing on what's the way it's always been done. Just keep focusing on the easier, you know, tack, you know, tangible X's and O's, et cetera. So you're, you're a hundred percent right. And yeah, that was one of my, uh, literally my study. I was like, yeah, no, this, this stuff is not founded on any research on any of the, the true and tested hard, like research studies that show this stuff works around different transformational coaching, leadership practices and behaviors that have been tested and shown to be effective. And yet that's not hard integrated in a big part. Jean Cote, who we had on last season in the declaration of war has a great whole transformational coaching part. It's not part of the HP one. It's getting integrated to some degree at at, at some different levels in some of the coach education. But again, I think it should be the main or a huge focus. Whereas it's generally often small. It's kind of an add on piece. It's not a big part. uh, Because it's not sexy. It's not sexy. People want to hear what the Maple Leafs are doing on their PK. People want to know what, you know, Colorado's doing on their four check. And they want to, they want to bring that into their peewee hockey team. And yet they, then they yell at Johnny and Billy and, and, and Scotty because they can't four check like Nathan McKinnon. Like to me, that is asinine. That's asinine. And I just think that's where kids get turned off by the game. You know, so it's 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 a combination of 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 everything, but I just think you're you're at, you're right. It has to be at the forefront because a coach needs to understand you're dealing with people. At the very essence, you're dealing with people who are human beings that you got to sit there and reach that that kid. So maybe the kid's got a learning disability. You don't know that. 
you know, most coaches don't know if their kids, the kid that's in that that's playing first line center might have ADHD or has a learning disability. And, you know, maybe he's dyslexic. They don't know that. They just know that that first line center scores goals. And so that's, that's what I'm saying. Like, that's where an organization should, if the, the, uh, like if, if some, if I was starting an organization today, that's what I'd be, un, you know, imploring my coaches to understand and making sure we get to know our athletes. Because if you get to know your athletes as people, they'll go through the wall for you as a player without question, without question. I believe in my heart of hearts for that. First, first you, you, you touch their heart, then you ask for their hand is the saying. First you touch their heart, then you ask for their hand. And then now you got, now you got a, 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 a disciple that'll go through a wall. And that to me, that's the essence of coaching. That's the essence of leadership. That's the essence of ownership. If, you, if I owned a team, that's what I'd be imploring. If I was a GM of a team, that's what I'd be imploring. Now I'm fired up. I'm fired up. I I think, yeah, you're good. I got, we got you going. There we go. Look at, look at the spark here. What, uh, the other side that I want to make sure we touch on is just the whole money side with a new sport too. It's just how, especially hockey, there's other, again, hockey's not the only expensive sport, but it's especially in the GTA, GTA, there's areas of ink, like there's lots of like it is becoming so so expensive, which is there's inherent a lot of problems within that. And where again is the leadership and the structure to make this a more affordable, reasonable, you know, way to develop and sporting experience instead of you know, it's costing tens of thousands of dollars for people at you know, 10, 11, 12, let alone probably more. And I think. And, and, you know, it's not that people shouldn't spend money. You can spend money if people want and they have the money, but it's more about like, but then there's just, it just prices so many people out and it's, it's, and it adds to the, all kinds of the pressures, the stress, the focus on results and demands, and it just skews the whole culture or environment to make it again, more about performance than development often, not always per se, but it's like that to me is a huge thing. And, and we talked about it with Mike around the privatization of rinks, the privatization with uh, private schools. And so um, th- like what can be done to further regulate and we're kind of keep going towards, you know, what can the organizations, the leagues uh, be doing and, and then, and, and leading us to, you know, consider what, what are the ways to fix the culture um, or fix hockey. But I think that that money, part is it's getting worse, not better. That is, it's only getting worse because that makes all kinds of other, you know, problems and, and environmental and, and uh, challenges on the, on the mindset of the players and, and the culture um, worse too. So that, I don't know if you want to speak to that one. And then there's a, a couple other little ones uh, as we start to try to wrap up that, here and put a bow on yeah, it. Yeah. I think that's pretty self-explanatory. You know what I mean? I think, you, you know, you said money's, money's there and it's, you know, it's all sports, all, all youth sport. Like youth sports is a huge business. And and um, just I think right around Christmas, there was a, a baseball company run that was run by Cal Ripken Jr., the, the Hall of Fame baseball player. It was Ripken Baseball, him and his brother. They owned a bunch of fields, uh, stadiums and, and, and fields and minor, minor youth, minor uh, baseball organizations. I think it sold for like a couple hundred million dollars like to – like so, it, it, like that's baseball. That's you. Like I, I get that, but it, youth sports right now is it's a multi billion dollar business. You know, not just hockey, not just hockey. And so, you know, there's everybody has a philosophical bent to that, um, and it's certainly it it, it does impact uh, a lot, as you said. So, yeah. So let's the other big area to dive in before we kind of try to start to wrap this up is. You know, the, and we, we've touched on a bunch of ways is the leadership, because it's one thing to have a structure and, and when the structure is not supportive, it's hard to lead as a coach within that. But, you know, we talked about the coach education, the coaches obviously still have a role and, you know, prioritizing that. But I, my thing is Hockey Canada, the provincial governments, the leagues, the organizations themselves is looking there with what is their responsibility? What are they doing? What are we doing with our time and our energy? If like, because I don't know. And maybe someone can come and educate me or like, I would love to hear more about it. But like, if I was in the position 
And, and it, it would be hard if you're in that position. It's not like it's easy to make some of these decisions on what structural things and what, you know, how are we going to shake things up and do things differently and what initiatives are we going to do and promote? But like, uh, like, like, you know, shit's been hitting the fan for a while here with Hockey Canada. And, you know, there's, there's clearly been problems and challenges and, you know, things to be done differently. And like, like, I don't see at the high, like, and we, we were talking before off camera about, you know, top up versus, you know, or bottom up for versus top down. And, you know, like we need both. And definitely it's going to be more of a, a bottom up and then it is a bottom up kind of approach right now. And that's what we want to encourage. But at some point there's a tipping point. When can, when does the top and the people in real, like that are at, at a significant impact on structure and have significant impact on the rules and regulations and the, the way that the system is organized and, and clarifying what is normalized and what are we not going to tolerate and the accountability what what are those people doing? What can they be doing? And I think, and, and again, I'm not going to sit here and say I have all the answers because I don't, and I'm not in those positions and it wouldn't be inherently easy to be in it. But I think, and I really hope that the people in those positions are really critically reflecting on and having the willingness or the vulnerability or the courage to do things differently because it is needed. And again, what steps are those? You know, we'll talk about maybe some ideas and, and things in a second, and, and I'm not going to sit here and be like, oh, well, I have all the answers because I don't. That's not what I'm trying to do. But I think the leadership is needed at all levels of uh, within sport. And, you know, I, I'm just curious, like, what is being done and what can be done? And, you know, when will things change and and who's going to be stepping up? Because it, it is needed to be done. And I think the other interesting point and we were I was chatting with Aaron who wanted to actually join this but you know just timing conflicts and he talked about one of his great lines and I think back when he was on the podcast way back in season one he talked about consistency and leadership as well and that matters from coaches uh, especially at the coaching level you know who has consistent coaching leaders that have been there for a long time that's often a good sign of uh, an organization and even within you know, youth sport, like there's a co like the turnover and coaches in youth sport, like versus consistency. And uh, I think, again, looking at the role of leaders in all of this at the different levels is an important, critical question. I don't know if I if I articulated that well enough, but, you know, that that's one of the things where when I'm looking at is hockey broken, that's where I look to what can we do about it? What are the different people and the different roles What's the impact and what can they do, in the decisions and the initiatives? And what are they what are they putting their time and energy? Or they're just having meetings and talking about the problems, but no real uh, tangible action items, tangible accountability, you know, differences and changes to the structure and the system. So yeah, um, that's that's a bit of a ramp, but yeah, I don't know if you want to add on to that one, Chris. Well, it just goes back to I mean, what I believe here, I mean, in terms of the leadership within the, the these kind of organizations. You know whether you go all the way up to Hockey Canada or just in you know the regional, uh, provincial hockey organizations, or even in the U.S. with USA Hockey, etc. Um, I I just think there has to be a declaration of what what your values are, and then and then it's really just setting the setting the parameters. These are our values. This is what we're all about, and we need to stick to this, and we need to be a hard line on it, and have hills that we're going to die on, and let's start making these things happen, and not be as bureaucratic. Like when you sit there and say they're sitting around talking about it, well maybe that's the problem. There, it's too bureaucratic. It's too political. Well, we got to satisfy this person. We got to satisfy this region. At some point, you got to stand for something, or you fall for anything. And right now, we're we're talking about it. We're falling for anything right now. So at some point, the leaders within hockey. So maybe it's got. Maybe it's an organization. Maybe maybe it's a president of of some hockey organization in the middle of Manitoba. Maybe you know they they sit there and say, yeah, we're going to stand for this. Maybe it's a couple organizations in British Columbia. Maybe that's where they start. They say, "Hey, these are this is this is what we stand for. This is who we are. This is what we're all about. We're going to do this. You do what you got to do." That's where I think change happens, because then it becomes a snowball effect, and then maybe the tipping point is that the people who are bureaucratic start to realize the tsunami's coming, and you know what? 
Maybe we saw it with, with Canadian Soccer Association with the president resigning yesterday because you know what? The women's soccer team were ready not to play in Florida during the, you know, the, the tournament that they were in. So maybe it got to a point where, hey, we got a World Cup coming up. We need to be treated properly. So maybe that's what needs to be done. These organizations need to have a little bit more stones, have their own self-leadership to be able to say, this is who we are. This is what we're all about. We're going to hire coaches accordingly. This is These are the parameters. These are our values. You do what you got to do on that end. We'll do what we need to you know do on our end. And then let's see where the chips fall. And I think that's what needs to be done here. Yeah. No, yeah, I think that's really well said. And, and, and we've been dancing around it and saying it in different ways, and that leads into it quite well. Can it be fixed? If hockey's broken, can it be fixed? And, you know, I think uh, a good insight to it is like, what does it even mean to be fixed? Will it ever be fixed? And maybe it's not about being fixed, but can it get better? And what, what are the measures? And we were alluding to that earlier. And like you just said, here's what we're about as an organization. Organizations can make a stand. The, the, at the different levels, they can make a stand. This is what were our values. This is what we're going to measure. This is what um, we're going to prioritize. Here's how we're going to go about things. And then here are the consequences if you don't too and the accountability. But, you know, and, and a good kind of obvious contrast and in a weird way, it's like a world, more world junior gold medals. Is, is that what we're about? Is that what our definition of success is as a nation? And in some ways, I'm not saying that that shouldn't matter, but like, is that the main measure? Is that because it seems to be a lot of time and energy from Hockey Canada goes towards that, and we could and like and maybe that's easier to see the tangible things that they're doing. So maybe it's a, a like again, our perspective is is limited, but I would like it to be very clear. This is what we're measuring. This is what we're about. We will define success. Here are our initiatives that we're going to do and prioritize to lead to these outcomes. You know, uh, enrollment, player satisfaction. Etc. One of the organizations, I know you work with some as well. One of the organizations I work with, we're doing the environmental scans, which is a anonymous assessment of the leader. And so from the players, it's a great tool and the organization, which is all the teams are generally doing quite well. It's a great tool. And then I sit down and go through the assessment and the ratings of the coach. That's what they're like. They're creating a culture and they're really focused on educating, supporting their coaches on the human skills, on the mindset, on what, how are your players rating you? How are your players rating each other and the environment and, and amongst themselves? And how are the players rating themselves and, and giving this data to coaches as well as them to, you know, just their general input and, and putting comments in a safe environment. And it's, it's about now coach development. Players, the coaches are asking the players to develop it. You know, that, that's an example of an organization going, you know, kind of more of a, a bottom up, being like, hey, we're going to do things a little bit differently. We're going to invest in this. We're going to focus on that. And I think, you know, it's, it's a small thing and, but there's just so many other organizations. What is everyone else doing? What are, what are the, like in the, the higher levels, the, the younger levels? And, and that's just a small example, but I think there's so much room to grow. One of the ways that I would look at is like, when will it be fixed? When will we really start to see, you know, the tipping point, like my, my hunches with the way things are going, I don't see anything getting a significantly better for a long time. It's decades away. It could be 10 years. It could be less. Hopefully it's less. I like, uh, like I'm the first, like the biggest fan, even though, you know, I get a lot of players and athletes that come to me because of the stress of sport. There's always going to be stress in sport. Like, like I always have uh, a job or business that always has work to be done. And what matters to me is I want people to enjoy the journey. As long as people are doing ambitious things and achieving and working, there's going to be stress and managing your mindset and being able to get in the zone and, and manage your con- like all these human skills and mental skills. They're always, you know, a value and can support and, and be used. What I'm about and why we do this podcast, like is simply to try to have an impact on from the other side, from the coaches, from the teams and, if this podcast can help a couple people and go that way and it snowballs or some of the other ones do, that's why we're doing it. And so my hope is that it shifts and changes better. And I don't know what else I can do to keep doing that. I'm trying to work with one player at a time, one team at a time, one coach at a time, one video at a time, one podcast at a time, pushing for that. Cause like that's, that's what drives me. I'm like my values and where, where my void is in from my experience in hockey and which large part, which driven me to the career that I have and doing this podcast with you, Chris, is that I have, there's this vote, like hockey is broken. Hockey and an elite sport is creating stress, frustration, worry, 
fear mentalities that are not enjoyable. And I want to shift that culture and have less people there and be more about enjoying the journey. It's not to make things easy, but it's to enjoy and embrace hard things and grow from it. And so they can enjoy the journey, enjoy the experience of sport. And it's supposed to help you become better leaders and better life skills. And a lot of people are missing the boat because again, of the structure. So again, how quick will things change? Can it get changed? Like I'm somewhat pessimistic just because of what I'm seeing and the, the, and I can clearly see like to make the shifts at the greater level and the creating the structure to really do like, I don't like, that's not easy to do. Uh, It doesn't necessarily have to be that hard per se. And obviously in some ways it can be very difficult because it's such a big organization like hockey Canada and, and the, the people under that umbrella is huge. So to, to change things in that big of a ship, it takes time potentially, but Hey, hopefully it could happen quicker. So I, I'm not going to try to predict, but my hunch is when we're looking at how can it be fixed? What does it mean to be fixed? What can be done? You know, in some ways I'm pessimistic, but I also think I'm trying to be realistic. And in some other ways I'm optimistic and really encouraging. And, and what I'm fighting for is to get that change to happen quicker and sooner because we see a day in day out, you know, athletes, kids, you know, adults, like people going through things. And it's just like, what are we thinking, creating the structure, talking to people in certain ways, running organizations, coaching, leading in these ways. So there, there, there's lots that I'll, that I'll, I I could ramble on that for a while. I'll try to wrap it up to be mindful of our time here. Um, And the other thing that I'll, I'll bring up and then I'll I'll throw back to you, Chris is also, you know, what Dan Carcillo uh, and the, the class action lawsuit and the, you know, and, and Rick West said, like, there's different people out there as well, creating noise and disturbance and shining a light on, hey, this is broken. This is not right. The I saw the tweets um, a couple of weeks ago about some of the um, excerpts, like people like about their experience in the major junior. League, and it's just like, and, and, it's, and I can relate, like my experience was not great. I was not as significantly or as, um, as much, you know, uh, abuse in the way that was highlighted in, in there, but like I, I, it doesn't surprise me at all. And it's it's very much broken. It's become very clear there are some significant um, challenges within hockey and a lot of other sports as well. And um, you know what it can be done to be fixed. What does that mean? What are some other things? I think we've talked about in a lot of different ways. Um, I'll throw it back to you to maybe the last couple few thoughts here, and we'll start wrapping this up because. I think we've uh, hopefully addressed some good points today and uh, provoke some people to think and to act differently. And, and hopefully there's, there's a bit of a snowball to some degree effect at the least we're trying here to, to, to share our message and our thoughts and our opinions. Go ahead, Chris. Yeah. You know what? So I, my, my challenge, I challenge organizations, whether it be at the major junior, the junior a level, minor hockey organizations, I would challenge them Um in the essence of, of trying to, you say, be, become better leaders. Okay. I'll go back on that. Um, and, and, you know, the organizations that, that I work with, that you work with, the coaches that I work with, and, you know, I'm sure that you do and you articulated some, um, you know, one of the things I try to impress upon them is that, you know, with the advent of, of information today, video everybody's got video minor hockey players have video so the minor hockey teams have video so there's really no nowhere to hide in terms of what you're doing sometimes you can you can surprise a team periodically with a new new wrinkle but that that's that changes quickly because because of video so i i use the term there's a democratization of information everybody has access to basically the same amount of information on the technical tactical side but here's where i'm going to challenge organizations is on the being able to teach their people how to be better leaders. Better leaders create a better environment. Better environment creates better players. Better players become be, you know a better team. And the point I'm trying to make with all of that is, you know, it, it's in that 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 void that when when a team raises the trophy at the end of the season, that championship team very rarely does a player or a coach or coaches or minor hockey parents say, oh yeah, it was our power play system, our power play breakout, or the, you know, the PK four check. They'll invariably nine times out of 10 talk about the character of the team, the leadership on the team, how hard the guys worked, you know, the fact that the coach believed in this player and that player, the fact that, you know, 
some kid that didn't that nobody expected showed up in the seven game series and blocked his shots. And that's the point I want to impart on organization from major junior all the way down is that if you can get your people to understand it's on the human side, that's going to be the benefactor that, that it's going to be allow your organization to be a benefactor, whether it be a championship or have some success, then I think then that's, that's part of the change. That's how it can be fixed. So again, I'll riff about power play breakouts and PK four checks and, you know, you know, neutral zone regroups. I'll do that any day of the week. But I, I think my mission is really challenging organizations, coaches, owners, everybody to sit there and say, we need to be and produce better leaders within our, 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 our programs. That's going to be able to produce better hockey players. And I, and I think we'll, we'll try to wrap it up because, you know, we, we've said a lot. Hopefully people have listened and appreciate people for listening today. Always encourage some feedback, questions, what their takeaways are. Find us you know, online on Twitter and whatnot and, or, or email us. And, uh, but you know, one of some of my final thoughts too, from like, you know, any leader in particular coaches looking to develop those human skills, there's just so much, there, there is lots of good education, whether it's reading, listening to podcasts, books, et cetera, you know, that that's part of it. But I want to encourage two other big things, which are who's your support person. There's, there's so much to be had. And then within organizations, that could just be coach to coach or a coach developer or an outsider or, or performance coach, et cetera, that helps you see your blind spots. Talk to someone about the human skills beyond the X and O's, a simple thing that can be done and so important, not just talk about X and O's, um, but have a supportive mindset and culture around that within your coaching group or leadership group or you know organization or league, et cetera. So that support matters. And another interesting final thought too is just the the benefit of introspection or introspection, like looking within, sitting by yourself in silence. Not like it's kind of meditation, meditation, probably a whole other topic I can go into on another time, but it's the idea of slowing down to speed up. It's the slowing down to better understand, to get clarity and certainty, uh, to find that inner voice, to find what you're about, how you want to move forward, how you want to operate and, and what your values are. Like that's, that's an important skill that our culture generally in the Western culture does not do a good job. We just overly pride ourselves on being busy and just go to the next, 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 do the next thing. What am I doing, 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 and not just being and being present and self-reflecting, being self-aware. So those are, are three things that don't have to necessarily cost a lot of time or money or anything. And it's very available and, uh, and we encourage any leaders to be, to, to jump in on that. So uh, I think I'm going to wrap it up with that. Uh, Chris, I'll, do you have any final thoughts, questions? Otherwise, we'll we'll wrap this up. I've said all I need to say. Awesome. Well, appreciate everyone for listening. Reach out with any thoughts, questions. We'll see you in the next episode. Thank you. Thank you.